This conference will now be recorded. Well, hello everyone and welcome to our presentation tonight on March the 19th, 2020 called Family Oral History Projects. My name is Wes Fryer and I am coming to you tonight from Oklahoma City where I live and the slides as well as the recorded video for the session are going to be available afterwards on YouTube and it will be specifically linked on the website designcreateshare.com slash videos. And so on a number of the slides tonight, I'm going to be uh, sharing a QR code. And so if you happen to have an iPhone, you can just open up your camera app. You don't need a special app or anything to do this. And it will scan that and actually take you to that web link. But I'll be providing everybody with a uh, copy of these slides. I'll be forwarding you the Google Slideshow that you can have access to. And so these slides are linked and you'll be able to um, you know, access all the resources that we're gonna talk about tonight. So um, I have been doing oral history projects for quite a few years. I'm currently uh, a teacher and a technology coach at the Cassidy School that's here in Oklahoma City. And if you were to ask me, you know, what would you like to teach Wes if you could teach, you know, anything, any kind of workshop, I would probably say, you know, oral history. I mean, it's just, it's something I've loved and I've, I've been able to, um, to do it a lot, both with our family and as a teacher and in, in community and even statewide projects. And so it is something that I just, I find to be so engaging. And so as this coronavirus or COVID-19 situation has been, you know, accelerating in the last week, um, and, we're, and our school is actually on spring break this week, but we're going to be starting what we're calling remote school next week with our students. I just realized that, you know, as parents think about projects and teachers, you know, we have so many different devices today in terms of smartphones or tablets or computers that can record. And so it's just a perfect time to talk about oral history. So uh, if you happen to be on Twitter, there are a couple hashtags that I follow. And uh, if you want to share anything that you're doing, you can you can tweet directly to me as well. And I'll see that. But um, the hashtag design, create and share is one that I'm starting for this project. This webinar is, is being shared as a part of. And then I also really like the hashtag create to learn because I think a lot of times we learn the best when we create. And so <clears throat> whatever context you might be looking at this from, whether it's just personally you want to do oral history projects or you're a teacher, um, you know, or um, maybe you're thinking about a bigger project. You're thinking about something for a, an upcoming family reunion or, you know, some some larger initiative. Um, you know, what, hopefully what we're going to share tonight is going to be applicable to you. So I'm a real fan of the musical Hamilton. Our family has had an opportunity actually to, to see this uh, crazily enough a couple times. When it came to Oklahoma City, I won the drawing twice. And so uh, we, we got to, my wife and an older daughter got to go and then our younger daughter got to go with me. And I just, I love Hamilton for a lot of reasons, but one of the things that really sticks with me is <clears throat> in this you know song, uh, Who Lives, Who Dies, Who Tells Your Story, uh, you know, they, they sing about, you write, this is talking about Alexander Hamilton, you write like you're running out of time. And, you know, we, uh, we don't know how long we've got on this earth, and I'm not wanting to just be totally macabre, but I'm getting older, I'm going to turn 50 this year, and I've, uh, you know, realized that when people tell you your kids are going to grow up and you're going to have an empty nest really quick, you know, they're not kidding. Uh, life marches on, and <clears throat> sometimes projects like this, where we're talking about interviewing maybe members of our of our family, that could be immediate family or extended family, or maybe they're people in our neighborhood or people in our community. Uh, they may be things that we have put off and we haven't done, and we're thinking it's just too big of a project. And so I just want to say at the very beginning, you know, who is going to tell that story? And what I want to suggest to you is that you're the one, you're the person, whether it's to tell your own story or maybe it's to record and share the story of someone else. Uh, you know, there's no time like the present. And as many of us are finding ourselves working from home, <clears throat> you know, even, you know, kind of confined to home for, for weeks. I mean, we don't know how long this thing is going to go on in terms of coronavirus here in, in 2020, but it's going to be for a while. And so 
uh, there's there's just some really, really good opportunities that we're going to have to uh, connect with family members and those that we might be with physically, but there's also opportunities to do things with with those that we might not be worth with physically, uh, but we can connect to them in another way. So um, this is a photograph of my father-in-law, Carl Ward. And he's my, my wife's dad. And both of my wife's parents, Carl and Clara, passed away this last year. And so this really, you know, dr dramatized or brought home to me the importance of, of storytelling. And, you know, we, we have uh, some interviews and things like that, but it's, um, it's something that we can't get in their own words now. One of the things I've learned doing oral history projects is, you know, the best thing, of course, is to interview somebody when they can tell their own story. <clears throat> but maybe you're going to basically do a project about someone who's passed on, but you have letters that they've written uh, or you have some other, you know, things that they've, uh, you know, written down that, that weren't letters, but maybe they were, um, you know, some some other kinds of writings and you're going to give those voice and read those and share those or maybe you're just going to talk about memories of them and you're going to document their life in that way it's wonderful if we can if we can interview folks and get them to share their story and that's a great thing about the brain is that even though we you know don't necessarily remember as we get older, our, our brains don't seem to work as fast and we don't always remember the short-term things. The long-term things tend to stick more. And so uh, I've had an opportunity to interview, you know, older people. And um, one of the things I've found actually as a tip is that when you're going to interview somebody, especially an older adult, if you can have a member of their family, a younger member, like maybe, you know, one of their kids present, that can really help to draw out stories. And I've also found if they have photo albums and things that can help trigger memories, you know, that can be something else as well uh, when you're wanting to do some oral history. So today's goal of our webinar is really empowerment. And I'm going to use this phrase digital witness because that just resonates with me deeply. Back in 2013, I had an opportunity to share my first TEDx talk down at the University of Oklahoma. And the title of that is Becoming Your Family's Digital Witness. I'm not going to you know, play that. You can certainly check that out uh, for yourself if you want. But, you know, this is something that we all have the have the power to do now, especially if we have any kind of, of mobile phone. Right. If we've got any kind of smartphone, it has the ability to record. And so we can become a digital witness of our own life, of the lives of our family members and you know, the, the opportunity we have is to preserve that, not just for today, but, you know, theoretically for all posterity. We're going to talk about where you save these things and where you share them and how we want to avoid putting it somewhere that goes away, you know, because we could lose the recording. And so we may want to, you know, put it in more than one place. But that's really my goal today is to empower you. And for those of you that have joined our uh, our uh, webinar a little late. Uh, I'm glad you're here and welcome. <clears throat> we are going to be, uh, you'll be receiving these slides as a link following tonight's um, webinar. And then I'll also uh, be, I'm recording this. And so the audio recording this is going to be available to you if you'd like to check it out. And I you know, would love for you to share this with others. And really, I hope that this is going to be a resource that that people are going to utilize to, you know, do some oral history here in, in, you know, the next weeks, months, and years. So I'm also going to mention to you a book project that I'm not going to be focusing a deep dive on, but I have been working on this actually for 10 years, and I'm using that same word, digital witness, here. Uh, and the title of that book is Pocket Share Jesus, Be a Digital Witness for Christ. And that goes into not only audio recording and oral history, but a lot of other ways that we can be digital witnesses. So I want to give you that link and just mention that to you. That's available on that link um, free. Um, I, I hopefully we'll have that up on Amazon later this year. So today's outline is basically four things. Um, I want to show you some examples of oral history projects because there's really no better way to kind of think about what's possible than to, you know, see some some actual projects. But then we're going to jump straight to apps and software for oral history projects. I'm providing you with some links on how to use these. And when we get to the Q&A, we're shooting for uh, 60 minutes today. And so I'm, I'm pretty sure I'll be able to leave some good time for some Q&A. And we may not take the full 60 minutes. We'll just kind of see, you know, what kind of questions you all have. 
Um, I want to point out that there is a chat, and so if you want to click on that icon that looks like people, um, you can uh, see the chat and, and you can go ahead and type any questions that you have. Feel free to type anything uh, as we're you know going along here, and I will be you know monitoring that, and then at the end we'll also have you know more time for question and answers. So I would say these are examples of citizen journalism. Sometimes we've thought of journalists perhaps as you know just professionals, uh, but I like the definition of journalism as really an act. And you know, any of us can can be a journalist, and we might think more of journalism as something that happens has to do with current events and news. Uh, but any of us can can uh, document things now digitally, and we have the potential, as I said, to document these not just for ourselves, but if we you know save them in places that are going to remain accessible uh, in formats that we'll be able to use you know down the road. These are things that you know your your great grandchildren, your great great grandchildren. I mean, who knows how how many uh, years down the road these kinds of things can uh, can be there. And wouldn't that be cool? Wouldn't you love to have an oral history? Uh, interview with your great 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 grandmother or you know any any ancestor that just goes back a couple generations and so um, after we talk about apps and software we're going to talk about workflow in other words what steps uh, do you need to think about taking to do an oral history uh, project and then also uh, think about um, think about going ahead and you know, if you're if you're a classroom teacher, and I see that we've got some of uh, of, of of some Cassidy uh, Cassidy person here in the in the audience tonight, uh, if you're thinking about doing this with your students, um, this is a fantastic project to do. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen a project that has more parental buy-in than doing oral history, because families, you know, immediately understand, hey, this this isn't just for a grade. You know, this is something that can be preserved in our family, and and maybe you know, maybe grandma is going to tell stories that we haven't heard before. Sometimes this happens when, you know, kids will come and ask their grandparents or even their parents for stories. And so then we'll leave questions at the end for Q&A. Um, so let's first talk about some examples of citizen journalism projects. And actually, let me ask in the chat, uh, have any of you done oral history before? So if you just want to want to type into the chat, you've got a couple little icons there. One of them looks like people, and that's actually showing showing you the usernames of who's logged in today. But the one that looks like a speech bubble is the chat icon. So has anybody um, who's in our webinar today actually done any kind of oral history interviews? Have you used your phone before, or I guess anything? You don't have to be using a phone, uh, but have you have you recorded before? It does not look like we've got anybody saying that they have done this before. So cool. Well, let's let's talk about examples. I think I've got four of these in here. Ah, good. Uh, one of one of our participants has done a little bit. Um, and it, go ahead and put if put in the chat if you want to any kind of details like what you used, if you used an app or who the person was that you recorded. Um, this first example is the Eagle Scout project of our son. Our son is now a senior in college, and he's having the interesting experience of having his college like everybody else around the country going online uh, to finish up his senior year but when he was in high school and he was a scout he did an eagle scout project at a local retirement community where his grandparents also lived and at that time it was called the statesman and and what he did was he taught other scouts how to um, record you know oral history and then recorded these using a free app that the group StoryCorps provides. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but on a lot of these slides, I've got a QR code, which is that weird looking square that has that looks like, you know, it's computer generated, which it is. <clears throat> and so I'll be sending you these slides, but also if you want to on any of the slides that are coming up in the webinar, uh, you can just use your iPhone. If if you've got the uh, an iPhone, you can use the camera app to scan that. And so uh, there were 11 different interviews that Alexander and the scouts were able to do and preserve. Um, and so uh, one of our participants today is saying in the chat that uh, her grand she and her grandfather have used the voice recorder app and the memories app. Uh, from fa uh, family search before. So that is fantastic. In fact, I'll be curious as as we go through these apps <clears throat> and talk about them, if there's something else that you've found that you know works really well. Uh, this is the kind of thing that's always changing. And in addition to make, you know, needing to be updated on where do we save these things, we also, you know, some of the apps that I've used before have kind of come and gone. But luckily there's some fantastic ones and 
Um, all the ones I'm going to talk about tonight are actually free, uh, and most of them are available for both iPhone and Android. So StoryCorps fits in, into that category. So I'm going to just uh, play uh, this two-minute video. This is a video that Alexander uh, made right after he had completed his Eagle project, and I'll give you just a little bit of information and background about that. I am Alex Fryer, and I just um, concluded my Eagle Scout project here at the Statesman. We were recording interviews with the residents here um, and having them or giving them the chance to tell stories about growing up and what they did. So these stories will be published online and collected on a site for their families and for others to view and listen to. And um, kind of talk through what you're going to be doing. And then you're going to. Hello, I am a scout from Troop 386. Today is October 10th, 2015, and we are at the Statesman in Oklahoma City for an Eagle project to help seniors document a few stories of growing up and their life. I am speaking with Irma Paul from Montana. So, Mrs. Paul, Tell me about where you grew up and what your childhood was like. Well, I was born in Beatrice, Nebraska. A very small town called Spalding. Uh, population probably 35. Uh, my mother graduated from Spalding High School and she met my father uh, out in that area. I went to California, and I spent two years. I was not with a scout, so I had a sub scout who they were living to from the neighborhood area that we worked with through school. And that was always very helpful. Okay, well, um, this project was definitely one of the coolest, if not the coolest, Eagle project I have done. I uh, got to talk to a lot of interesting people, learn a lot of history about their lives, about how things were back then. It was truly amazing. All right. So uh, if you want to respond to that in the chat, just to say any thoughts that you have um, about that, I can give those voice and, and share those. <clears throat> One of the things that I think is really, really good about oral history projects is it it gives us an opportunity to sit down and listen to each other and tell stories. You know, we have been telling stories to each other forever, and our brains are literally wired to remember stories. Um, if you are a teacher or you're any kind of public speaker, you know, listening to a, a good preacher preach or a politician, you know, they're going to use stories and storytelling because they know those are the things that are going to stick in our minds. And so we're in a very you know, technologically media filled world. Uh, and there's all kinds of social media apps and, you know, games and things like that. But, you know, being able to sit down and, and have someone tell us some stories and listen like that by itself is a great experience. I also want to mention, I'll talk a little more about this, that this StoryCore app, it's fantastic. It's free. It's available for both Android and iPhone. And when you create an account, it actually will upload and save the audio recording with a picture. So you can see this example that's on the screen there of, of Eric Hoggard's, you know, interview <clears throat> that um, is with it. And so that's nice because I don't know how, how much you listen to podcasts and audio. But, you know, and if you're driving in the car, that, that's great. You know, but we don't hopefully want to be watching a video unless you're in a self-driving car. But a lot of times, if you're just playing audio, it, it helps to be able to establish a little picture of, of who is it that's talking, and both of those things are, are captured by the StoryCorps app. So here's another example, and this one is uh, another personal connection. This is one that our daughter, Sarah, who is now a freshman in, in college after her gap year, did when she was in high school, and this is an interview with my dad, and she used a free app called Voice Record Pro. And this is a free iPhone app. This is actually, I think, of the of the apps that and software that I'm going to talk about. Um, this is is the only one that's only for i for iPhone or iOS. It can work on iPad as well. The other ones are going to work on Android. But boy, this one I love so much more even than like the built-in voice recorder app because what it lets you do is save it as a video. So that was a picture of 
our daughter Rachel and and Sarah with my dad, uh, who they call Wildcat. And uh, we were at home in their in their old house that they've now sold. And you know, took a picture that my dad was a pilot, that was his helmet. And anyway, all of that was on the phone. And then we saved it as a video and put it on YouTube. And so you can actually see this, this video has only been seen four times, but you know, to our family, like that doesn't matter. It's so cool that this has been preserved. And so this is a 38 minute interview. I am not going to play 38 minutes, um, but I will just play a little bit of this. And I want to comment that in terms of a tip and technique, whenever you're recording uh, with a phone, go ahead and put it on airplane mode. All right. And the reason for that is because you don't want to get a phone call or a text message or something that's going to be interrupting your interview. And so after you've done the recording, then you can go, you know, go off of airplane mode, reconnect to your cell phone data or Wi-Fi or whatever, and then you'll be able to share it. But uh, that's a really important tip to go ahead and do. And then the other thing is ideally it's good to just set the phone down on a soft surface. Um, the reason a soft surface is good is that <clears throat> it's going to absorb more of the audio. If you're, you know, on a dining room table that doesn't have a tablecloth, it's a hard surface, it's going to be more reflective. It's just not going to absorb audio and you're not going to hear as well. Now, let me say this too, though. Go with what you have. Uh, the interviews that the scouts did with the first example I showed you of our son's Eagle Project, I mean, they were doing that in the dining room at the, uh, at the Statesman. Uh, and, and so, you know, it was... It, it may not have been ideal, but it was good enough. And so getting the microphone end of your of your iPhone, which um, generally there's a couple microphones that are on there, but the uh, base of it where the, the home button is, if you've got one of the older iPhones or the, or the place where the plug plugs in, we can say now, newer or older, uh, that's probably the main microphone that's going to be utilized. You know, it's where you, the microphone is used when you, when you speak. Um, and so... Um, yeah, if uh, I've got a question in the chat about sharing some screenshots of the Memories app. Um, I think, I'm not sure actually if we can share a screenshot, but when we get to the Q&A, if you'd like to do that, that would be great. I kind of think, unless you have a link to it, if you want to put a link to the Memories app, Maria, um, I think we'll be, any all of us can click on that, and so you can put that in. And then when we get to the Q&A section, we can try. I've I've actually only done text chat, and I don't know that it'll let us directly attach a a screenshot in here. Um, but anyway, let's listen to just a little bit of this of this interview uh, that was from 2018. I'm here today and it is April 29th. And I'm here with my wildcat, who is Tom Fryer, and he is in Manhattan, Kansas right now. And we are on audio FaceTime and I am in Oklahoma City. How are you doing today? I am doing fine, and I would add that I am your grandfather, right? Besides your wildcat. That is true. Okay. Need to clarify that. Okay. Our first question is, when and where were you born? When and where? Okay. I was born in Powell, Wyoming. Uh, the date was August 21st of 1940, like almost 78 years ago. Is that where your family is originally from? No, uh, my family was born, my father was born in uh, South Dakota uh, in 1903, and my mother was born in Scottsbluff, Nebraska, also in 1903. Okay, so we just listened to a minute of that. I'm going to pause it. One of the things I want to point out here is that Sarah conducted this interview when she and her grandfather were not in the same place. And so there are some different ways to be able to record um and and they were on facetime audio the iphone and the ipad now have a built-in screen recorder and so i think that was how sarah actually did that i don't have that in the slides but uh i i think i'll go i'll probably add that afterwards and um just some instructions from apple because it's built in and uh, the trickiest thing to, to know about that is you have to manually turn the microphone on in order to record your microphone audio um, or, to, or even record audio, not to have it silent. Um, but I will, I'll do a little bit more research into that. It used to be trickier to do. Um, I know, you know, way back in like the 
mid you know mid 2000s we were you know using Skype and recording things and had to use kind of you know special software on a computer or whatever um, but uh, the, the the app anchor that I'm going to talk about also has some built-in ways to do that the other thing I want to point out from this recording is that Sarah had given her grandfather my dad the questions in advance and so uh, I'm going to talk in a minute about a really great resource from StoryCorps called the Great Questions uh, List that you can use to formulate questions. And you want to think about, you know, open-ended questions, um, a closed-ended question, something that just has a, has a quick answer. You know, uh, do you like French fries? How old are you? You know, where were you born? The open-ended question is, you know, uh, tell me a tell me a story about what you remember from elementary school. Um, you know, tell tell me about the activities you were in when you were in high school. Um, what do you, what are, what are your memory, what are your earliest memories? What do you remember about your, your parents? You know, those things require elaboration. Um, so we've got a question in the chat that says, what about phone interviews when you are far away from family members? Can you easily record those? So, I, I mean, it does add an, another layer. The Anchor app that I'm going to talk about in a minute does have some built-in ways to be able to do that. Um, and so, I, I will add to this slideshow. In fact, I'll put it in the slides uh, following this. Well, I'll put it in the app section because that's I've got the next sections about apps, and I'll put in some information about that. So basically, you you've got to be doing two things at once if you want to use your phone, which is the easiest way, pretty much, for most of us to do this. Um, on the computer, you can have some capture app, some capture software as well. But on the phone, you just got to make sure you know that it that it's recording. Uh, that phone call. And so that is definitely, I, I've learned you got to use the word easy carefully when it comes to technology because, you know, easy to one person is not necessarily easy to everybody, but there are ways to do that. And uh, we might even go in in the Q&A if you want to, we can dive in a little bit to the Anchor app and their website and see how they allow that to happen. So, uh, okay, next example, I'm not going to play this one, but this was just an oral history interview that our son did with my mom. And uh, the thing to point out here is, man, you want to be careful where you save these things and make sure that you have a backup. Um, I actually had published this on the StoryCorps app, but the StoryCorps uh, site changed their links. And so in this case, it's not missing forever, but I need to update the link. Um, we posted this on a website that we call our family learning blog. And so as the kids have been growing up, we've, you know, documented different things. They've written things and put things on this site. We haven't actually used it a whole lot in the last few years, but, you know, it's there and these things are archived. And so I ended up posting it two places. So you can see where the red arrow is pointing in this slide. That's actually missing. And Alexander uh, <laughs> is, is interviewing for jobs now. And I think he had, he had mentioned his Eagle Project to one of his his inter uh, the companies he was interviewing with and happened to notice that some of those links had changed and so he's he updated those on his website i need to update this one but there was a second copy of it and it's on a place called the internet archive and so this is a fantastic resource that anybody can register for a free account on uh, it is archive.org and when you upload something they will host it forever for free. Now, could they go bankrupt? You know, could they, you know, take their website offline? You know, sure, they could. Uh, and this has happened. There's, I mean, one of the, there's a couple of websites. There was one called iPatio, and there was another one called Cinch that I used to use. Uh, if, if my friend Joe Dale, who's from the Isle of Wight in the UK, happens to listen to this, you know, Joe is somebody who was super into using podcasts, especially in English as a second language classrooms. And I learned about a bunch of tools from him, probably learned about that iPatio tool from him. But the bummer is, you know, if those if those recordings weren't saved, they're gone now. So uh, when I was starting to get into podcasting and audio recording in the mid 2000s a lot of stuff around 2007 2008 I was actually you know posting some of those things and so you can actually see there's a couple uh, interviews additionally with my parents there's an interview with my mom from 2016 about being an educator there's an interview with my dad about I think that was growing up in Powell Wyoming and so um, there's different ways to go about this. You can go out and pay a company to have hosting space so that your files will live on their you know, web servers. But the problem with that 
is if you stop paying, guess what? Your files go away. They take them down. And so I'm really a fan of sharing oral history audio interviews on YouTube. Um, I don't think Google and YouTube are, are going bankrupt anytime soon, even with this coronavirus and all the unemployment and you know challenges we're going to have to the global economy. I think streaming video uh, companies and, and technology companies are are you know probably going to weather this you know fairly well. So anyway, YouTube I think is good, but the Internet Archive is something you may not have heard of before. Again, it is free. I have not you know paid to put on any of this stuff up there, and you can register, set up your own account. And then you can post your audio there for free. So the third example that I want to show is this one. And this is a project that actually uh, started at our church. So I called this one uh, Testimonies and Tales, Faith Stories. But <clears throat> I don't know how many years ago, maybe it was back in 20, 2010 or something. Um, I was a deacon for our church. And then we had, I think, four different high school students who are youth deacons. They served for only one year instead of three years. And one of the, and I was the the deacon that worked with them. And one of the things that we did was we we did some oral history, interviewing members of our church about their lives. My absolute favorite, and I'm I won't play it, but you can. This is a website, by the way, that I maintain. So my main professional blog that I've I've been blogging since 2003, and this particular website, speedofcreativity.org, has been online since uh, 2005. So I, you know, pay a company to be able to have this domain that I own through GoDaddy um, up and, and available. Uh, I, I need, I, I, I have backed this up, you know, at one point, but, you know, this is, this is an example where like if I wasn't paying that bill or something happened with our, you know, credit card, debit card or whatever that we registered there with, you know, these would go away. My favorite one on this, there was a woman, um, Ella May, who was one of the first Christian missionaries to Iran in the 1950s. And she passed away, I think like two years ago. But the interview that we did with her and the, the stories that she told about what, what it was like to live in Tehran and, you know, the Elbers Mountains that are there and just, you know, the the, the children that she taught. She was a school teacher. Uh, and then, you know, what it was like growing up in Edmond because she grew up actually in our church in Edmond. It's just fantastic. And there's several different um, interviews uh, that, you know, were part of that. And so anyway, uh, it's just another example. And I, I don't think, I, I, this is another slide I need to add. I will add a slide. This website is powered by a free um, project. Uh, shoot, and I think I'm going to just go ahead and link to it because I don't remember what it's called. I'll go down here to the bottom. Yes, podcast generator. So I'll put a link to this in the uh, the slideshow. And so if you end up wanting to host your own audio files, you got to be a little geeky <laughs> to do this or have a friend that'll help you. But this is free open source software that you can, you know, put on a website. And so it will host, you know, all of these interviews. And so, for instance, I can go to personal interviews and we can scroll down here a little bit. Orrin Lee Peters is, is a member, was a member of our church for years started in World War II. He's a veteran. Uh, and then here's the LMA interviews. Okay. So, you know, and we could, here, we'll just, we'll start. Welcome to the Stories of Faith podcast channel and ministry outreach effort by the youth deacons of the First Presbyterian Church of Edmond, Oklahoma. This podcast episode is the first of three parts featuring an interview with LMA Miller. LMA is a member of our church and celebrated her 90th birthday in June of 2008. She has five children, 18 grandchildren and 19 great grandchildren. She has lived an amazing life and in this interview, she shared memories of her life growing up, reflections on her journey of faith, and insights about the things which bring her joy as a child of God, living in almost a century on earth. Thanks to Ella May for sharing this interview, as well as Crystal McGee for assisting in the interview. Whenever I came to Edmond, uh -huh. I was going into Baptist youth group then. Okay. But my husband was very active in the, in the Pres uh, Presbyterian youth group. But he met me and and uh, wanted me to go to church with him, and I said, "No, you come and go with me." I mean, he won't. Uh, oh no, he could go with, with me, and uh, since I wouldn't go to his, he wanted to know if he'd go go with me. But I was going to Baptist youth group. All right, I'm gonna pause and we'll play more of that. Two things to, to note: number one, like when you ask. 
older adults to tell you stories from their life, like they can take a lot of time telling those stories. So, you know, just, just be aware of that and, and think about, you know, not, not having an appointment maybe scheduled right away after you're finished. Um, another thing that I just realized that I didn't put in here, this is a great website called Althonic. And sometimes when you record things, somebody is talking really quietly or there's differences in the, the audio levels and you need to normalize it out. And so that's kind of what this shows is that you can have different levels. And so uh, this particular app actually does cost some money, but I use this frequently when I have audio that I've recorded, and I need to fix it. So that's a little bit of an advanced thing, but boy, it's important because you really don't want, you know, that audio, um, that audio to, um, get out of this. Um, you don't want that audio to, you know, be poor quality. And, uh, if, if somebody's, you know, not, not been loud close to the microphone. Okay. So last example, one of my favorites, and doggone it if this one hasn't gone offline really since last fall. Uh, this is a project from Toronto, Canada, and it's called the Murmur Project. It, it's an example of a story of, of uh, place-based storytelling. And so uh, I didn't actually mean to advance the slide yet. What you see is a picture of a guy holding a flip phone. So you know this is kind of an old project, right? But around Toronto, what they've done is they've recorded stories about different buildings, different parks, different places. This is something we've been talking about at our school because you know we have certain benches that have been purchased and dedicated to a particular person, trees that have been purchased, and and we've we've talked about actually having a you know. Uh, the Q, a QR code, I think we're actually working on this, um, and having that link to that story. Now, so this is a little different because they're doing a phone number, but uh, here in Oklahoma City, uh, if you haven't um, been here, one of the things that a lot of times visitors and guests will come see is our bombing memorial to the, the Murrah Federal Building that was bombed in 1995 by Timothy McVeigh. And <clears throat> they they had one of these walking tours where the designers of the actual memorial would tell you at different spots around the memorial what you were looking at, why they designed it, why the chairs, are, some chairs are smaller and some are bigger and, and why they're positioned the way they are and all these different things. And it's just, it was fantastic to be able to hear them, you know, in their own voice. Now they've changed that and I don't think they're any longer doing that with a phone service. But anyway, that's a, that may be a catalyst for you thinking about projects because how neat is it to be able to access stories on the go when you're in a place, right? To, to look out on a lake and then hear a story of someone talking about, yeah, when they grew up, you know, the memories that they have of that place or of, of that park or that building, or maybe it's a building where the ruins are just there and, and the building itself isn't there. You know, we'll sometimes say, well, if these walls could talk, well, guess what? If we record oral history stories, about places and about people's lives. I mean, there is this potential for others, you know, down the road, and there's no telling how many years down the road that could be to be able to hear those stories. So I think that is pretty awesome. The website itself, uh, murmurtoronto.ca, at least as of tonight, is offline. Um, I shared a keynote this past September here in Oklahoma City for a podcasting conference that we we. Um, an organization called Story Chasers I've been a part of put on. And at that time in September of 2019, it was still available. You can see over here on the map, they've got, you know, uh, little dots, you know, showing where you can access these stories. And this is, this is something that I actually learned about, gosh, probably back in the, in the mid 2000s through the Center for Digital Storytelling which is based in Berkeley, California. And it's just a, a project that's always stuck with me and I think is is really fantastic. With smartphones, we have obviously, you know, much improved ways to access stories. But in the early days of cell phones, you know, before, you know, the iPhone in 2007, for instance, we didn't have apps and we didn't have, you know, phones that were as smart as what we have today. And so being able to dial a number and hear the story was was something that, you know, could make, place-based storytelling on location, a possibility when it couldn't happen otherwise. All right, so we are uh, actually 40 minutes into our slideshow and we got to talk about apps and I, I think I might need to pick up the pace a little bit. I want to be respectful of everybody's time and we're going to try to finish up here at the top of the hour. Again, uh, I think we've had some more people join us. I will be sending you an email with the link to these slides 
and and the, this recording will be available as well. So if you if you came in late, you'll be able to catch that. I've already mentioned these a little bit, and so just to kind of uh, highlight them again and then tell a little more detail. The StoryCorps app, it's gone through a pretty significant revision since our son did his Eagle project and some of those links have changed on, on websites, but the stories are still there. And so, um, you know, this is a, a project, as it says there on the website, that was funded through a, a 2015 TED Prize and then also the Knight Foundation. Um, you know, it's always possible that a business, a company, a nonprofit, whatever goes out of business, but StoryCorps is a, is a very popular project and it appears to be well-funded. I would recommend still keeping a backup of your stories somewhere else. Uh, you might even put them on like a USB flash drive or thumb drive. You could put those in the safety deposit box, right? Or wherever you keep your, you know, really precious uh, documents, birth certificates, marriage certificates, stuff like that. But it is a great app. and like the Anchor app I'll talk about in a minute, it kind of is a soup to nuts app because you can record and do some you know, tweaking of the recording and then also publish it. And so it takes care of a lot of steps that are just fantastic. It, it, it simplifies the process quite a bit. The other app that I would recommend most to you for audio recording and also this can be one for the classroom i know we've got one of our cassie teachers here in the room and um there's a one of our uh, history teachers our eighth grade history teacher in our middle school i was i've been working with and he just did some world war one audio projects and in that case the kids were reading poetry from world war one but they were creating radio shows and anchor was the app that they used and as you can see from this screenshot of the iTunes store. Anchor, Anchor is, by the way, available both for Android and for iPhone, and it is free. You can record your podcast, you can edit it, splitting it and trimming it right there on your phone, or if you have a tablet, um, you can do that too. It has background music and sounds that you can add, and then you can also add voice messages from listeners. So it gives you a, um, a way, I think it's a phone number actually, kind of like a voicemail, and so you can ask questions. And so you could even do a project. And this could, again, be for your family or it could be for school, whatever the context. And you could you could ask a question and send that out to your families. And literally those recordings would come into the Anchor account that you've set up. And then you can create essentially a, a collage, an audio collage of those audio files. And you can do all that from your phone. So <clears throat> Spotify, which as you may know, is a very popular streaming service today, along with Apple Music and Google Play Music. Um, Spotify purchased Anchor last year, and they also bought, I think, Gimlet Media, and they are really investing in podcasting. And so while this is an app and it says podcast, um, you know, just think audio recording. And so oral history is one thing that you can be doing and creating as a podcast. This is a fantastic, wonderful app. And so I am not going to play this for you, but I have created tutorials that step you through step by step how to use uh, some of these apps I'm talking about tonight. And so this one is how to record a podcast, uh, which can be an oral history interview, on a smartphone with the Anchor app. And so from the slides, or if you use that QR code, uh, you can access that. And so this session today or tonight is really more a awareness session to be aware of possibilities. I hope to both inspire and empower you to go on and do some oral history work with your own family. And if you're a teacher, you know, with your students. And so anyway, this is a tutorial that you're free to use. It's, you know, publicly shared up on YouTube and you can even use that with your students. If you don't want to make a tutorial, hey, use mine. Um, Anchor has some, of course, that they've made as well. So this app is called Voice Record Pro. I've already talked about it because our daughter, Sarah, in that second example, the interview with my father, she used that on her iPhone and it doesn't have a time limit. And like I had talked about, it allows you to export as a video to your camera roll. So this is actually, we'll have to check, but at school, we'll have to check. I kind of think we have this on our iPads at school. If we don't, we need to. And so this is a, this will jog my memory, hopefully to, to, to verify that. Uh, but anytime that, that anybody needs to record audio, it's really a great thing. And the iPad now has a files 
place that you can save things, but that requires that you log into iCloud and whatever. So anyway, I think it's great. You can export it in a variety of formats. You don't have to do it as a video. And even though it has the word pro in it, it is completely free. So it's called Voice Record Pro. And when I found this app, man, I just, I danced a happy dance because it has been a challenge before finding this app on how to share those audio recordings. And so uh, for teachers, like I know um, one of our teachers that's here in the chat, you know, uses this program called Seesaw as a learning journal for students to be able to share their work. They can take an audio recording they've made here with Voice Record Pro and, and they can share it, you know, in Seesaw. Seesaw lets you record also directly in there. But it's nice if you're going to be, you know, doing recording, just like you, you know, might use the camera app, um, you know, to take pictures before you go into another app like Seesaw, it's great to have another app to do the recording. So again, I will not play this, but I have a video tutorial. This one's only five minutes long, but this is how to use the Voice Record Pro app. Uh, it looks a little old school. You can see the level meter there and, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, a throwback or with its visual, which is visual interface to uh, older analog recording systems, but it is, it is a, a fantastic app. And then the last software program I want to mention is not for a smartphone. It is for your laptop or desktop pro, uh, computer. It's not for Chrome. Uh, in fact, I, I, I didn't put in here. There are some solutions that you can use that are web-based for students to edit to edit. I think Twisted Wave is one of those. But this is Audacity. And so Audacity is an open source software program. Open source means anybody can get it for free. And also anybody can look at the source code and they can even contribute. So this is a, a collaborative free project. And it is fantastic. I've been using Audacity since I think the mid 2000s. Uh, I, well, yeah, since I started podcasting, I started my podcast in 2005. And so it is great. And as you as you see in that little screenshot, it uh, shows you the waveforms of the audio. It's actually really cool to show that to students because you can you can tell visually when somebody's you know very quiet or you know when they're loud or when somebody claps, and you can go in there and edit. And so this is a more advanced software program than the apps I've talked about. But depending upon what you're working with, you may need to do some significant editing. And if you need to do significant editing, I think you probably want to work on a laptop. I'm talking about a full Mac OS or Windows OS computer. And this is a, a free program. There's other programs that you can use, but you know I've used uh, Audacity for like, I guess, 15 years now uh, at least and, and absolutely love it. So uh, how am I doing on time? We got about 12 minutes left, so I better get through this so we can uh, have some time for questions. By the way, if you want to go ahead and put in any questions as we go along, I'll be happy to answer those as we go through. Uh, you can just type those into the chat window um, that you've got there. Let's talk about the workflow for these projects. How are you going to do this? Uh, these slides are actually copied from the keynote that I shared at our local podcasting conference back in September of 2019, but you can just kind of substitute for the word podcasting, you know, oral history project, because an, again, an oral history recording, it can be shared as a podcast. Um, to truly be a podcast, it, it has to be posted on a website where somebody can subscribe to it. So when you use a, a program like Anchor, it takes care of that. Um, but I like these four steps. And, I, and here I'm thinking not only of, you know, parents or, you know, somebody just on their own who's going to do oral history, but if you're a teacher, you know, breaking it down into these steps is really important for your students. So you're going to plan the podcast and then you're going to actually produce it. That means record it. And then there might be, and there usually is, some post-production, meaning you're going to have to edit it a little bit. You may trim it. Uh, in the case of that LMA interview, I mean, that was long. We broke it into three different parts, and we published it in three different pieces. But after you've got it edited, and, you know, you might have to normalize it if the audio was too quiet. You know, hopefully you get a good quality audio. You don't have to do much uh, of, of the post-production. Then you're going to publish it, and you're going to share it. Um, Amanda's asking in the chat, for the Murmur Project, um, how did it start up? She thinks the city uh, she lives in would be a perfect place to set this up. I don't know, but we can probably find out. Um, I, as I mentioned, I learned about that through the Center for Digital Storytelling and uh, from their director. And uh, I bet we could find out. So if you want to, you know, contact me, we, or you know, the, the, there was a website where they still have information about the project, even though the main project website appears to be down. It could just be temporarily down right now. 
Uh, hopefully it's not, you know, permanently down, but you know, it's, I think it, I, I'm going to just, I'm going to guess that it started with someone who has a passion for stories and places, right? And, and probably the people who are here in this, you know, virtual webinar room right now are some of those kinds of people. So yeah, I, I love that. I mean, certainly that involves some different, different things with costs, but you can do something with QR codes now and not have to be, you know, using some kind of special service that would allow for the phone calling. Uh, and so smartphones, you know, have changed that. And that's one of the things we're talking about at our school. I think, we have some uh, some uh, some QR codes for trees being ordered and, and other special things. And so a long-term hope that I have is that we'll be able to have students involved in recording some some history stories from people who can tell stories about you know the people or the places, and then we'll we'll, we'll connect them in that way. So th there's a lot of steps potentially to this process. Here's the good news, all right? If you use an app like Anchor or the StoryCorps app, that one app can do all five of these steps because if you truly want to, to have a podcast, you know, you have to record and you probably edit it. Then you export it in some format. A lot of times it'll be an MP3 file that's a compressed audio file. Then it has to be uploaded to a server somewhere, uh, a website that is going to be, you know, providing a link to that. And it will be, you know, maintained over time. And then there's also, you know, going to be that link and then also what's called a feed so people can subscribe. I've been doing podcasting since 2005. It can be complicated. It's wonderful to be able to use apps that really simplify this process a lot. So let me just break down these steps really quick, and then we'll we'll have. I promise to save just a few minutes for additional Q and A. Again, continue if you've got a question to just drop it into the chat, and I can handle that kind of as we go. Step number one is planning. Um, I'm going to go ahead and click this link and and see if we can look at this. Yes, it's still there. This is the old StoryCorps I, uh, website, and this is what they call their great questions list. And so it has them broken down: questions for everyone, questions about working, uh, questions about war. You know, if you'd be interviewing a veteran, uh, maybe who has has come back from, um, you know. Uh, being in a military service in, in Iraq or Afghanistan or somewhere, they've got some questions here. Um, I like how they are asking open-ended questions. Some of the stuff here too, like look at this under serious illness. I mean, boy, what an, what an important time to talk about empathy and to talk about conversation. Because, you know, one of the things that, that I've mentioned to students before doing these kinds of interviews, especially if you do like a Veterans Day project, which we've done before, you know, you want to be sensitive to how you ask those questions. And you generally want to talk about, you know, maybe less heavy or serious things to, to really, you know, build really your relationship with that person and some trust before you ask them some questions that are difficult. And ideally you give them the questions in advance. So in planning this, this uh, picture on the side is one that my wife uh, used when she was doing a classroom podcast at a school called Positive Tomorrows here in Oklahoma City, uh, where all the students are homeless. And the kids um, were, were doing different kinds of uh, reports about what they were learning. And uh, they had different segments and things like that. And so they put those together and she would write a script uh, for them. And, and sometimes it would be kind of like a Mad Lib. If you've done a Mad Lib, it's like fill in the blank. But anyway, uh, you know, what are, what are the pieces of your pod, of your, uh, of your story going to be? Are you going to have an introduction at the beginning? Uh, like that one that you heard about Ella May, where uh, one of the high school students, you know, told a little bit about her life and how many, you know, children and grandchildren and great grandchildren she had, or are you just going to go right, right into the interview? Second is when you produce the podcast. And so you've got to think about the different pieces of it. Make sure your phone is charged. As I already mentioned, go into airplane mode on you know whatever device, iPad, iPhone, um, Android device. Try to set the phone down. If the if this person who's recording is moving it around, that, that rec that's going to affect the, the recording. You're going to hear that scratching or, or the background noise. Um, avoid hard surfaces. And you can also still get battery operated digital recorders. And one of the great things about those is they'll record for hundreds of hours without needing to, you know, be recharged. And so I'm, I'm actually a fan of those. You've got to still plug them into your computer. And so they're not as streamlined as an app, but they still can be great. And you can pick one of those up uh, usually for like, I don't know, probably now around $30. We used to pay about $50, you know, 10 years ago, and they've come down in price. 
Third step is post-production. This is when you edit. I've already talked a little bit about Audacity as a software program that, that runs on your computer, but Anchor is going to let you do some editing, um, you know, trimming, you know, splitting, and then if you need to normalize, good. I, I did have the reference there, Alphonic. That is a web-based uh, service that I have used to normalize. There's other kinds of fancy software uh, that can do that. Actually, Audacity can do some, you know, editing and and um, some. I guess I should say advanced processing. Um, and then possibly, if you're doing a podcast, you might also think about sort of the audio in between the segments. Those are called bumpers. And if you're going to have fades, and then if if you want to find music. Um, YouTube actually has an audio library of copyright friendly music. And so, you know, if you want to kind of take your, your audio recordings to another level, you can include some background music. Um, like I mentioned, the Anchor app actually has that. And they, they do something called ducking, which is when they reduce the volume of the background audio when, when there's narration, you know, over the top. Uh, but that's good to know. And there's other places that you can get free audio. Um, in terms of formats, usually you're going to want to save this as an MP3 file. And if you, you know, have downloaded music on your device, usually that's a, a much higher quality. I think it's either like 164 or 256 kilobits per second. The spoken word doesn't have to have as much quality and therefore it's a smaller file size. So I, I usually make mine at 32. But here's the good news. You don't have to worry about any of that technical stuff if you're using an app like the StoryCorps app or the, um, uh, the Anchor app because they just take care of all this, this for you. Uh, do be mindful of the formats. You know, do you, do you remember what a Super 8 or regular 8 camera was? You know, those are the, that's the movie format that my dad, you know, used to shoot our Christmas day, you know, movies or home videos on. Hey, do you remember cassette, cassette tapes, floppy disks, you know, zip drives? Now these are ancient, right? <clears throat> well, why am I saying this? If that's where your video, your uh, interview is, you're going to have to have a way of, of getting it off that device. And we've got, you know, videotapes, in our house today or they're in our garage in a box and I don't have a camera that will play them anymore. Um, my camera broke. So think about that and, and make sure that it's in a format that we hope is going to survive. And, you know, MP3 in terms of audio, YouTube, those things appear, they're going to, they're going to last for a long time. So I've already talked a little bit about this. Where are you going to host your files? You can pay a company like Liquid Web or Bluehost, but you can also use a free site like Anchor to be able to host those. The Internet Archive I've mentioned, you can also post to YouTube. So it's going to be a true podcast. You're going to want to use an app like Anchor but kind of for our focus here on oral history, not necessarily. You don't have to have to use an app that will do that. Um, Amazon S3 is actually where I have all of my podcasts now, and I back my, back things up there. Uh, it is a, a cloud hosting service, and so it's just a place that is very very affordable uh, to be able to you know put files. And so this is for folks that are going to be a little geekier with this. Um, a friend of mine years ago had told me about this and. And I found that to be nice because I just, my podcasts stay there, even though I've had to pay to move my website different places. That's where my files are actually uh, housed. So the last little resource I want to share, and then let's see if we've got any other questions. And if you want to start putting those questions into the chat, this is a website I have been building for the last seven years, since 2013, and it is called Show With Media. So showwithmedia.com. What do you want to create today? And so this is a, a open public website that you can go to. Um, I've written some books about different parts of this, but for our conversation today, the one called Radio Show is what you might want to check out, or even Digital Story, if you're thinking about kind of taking your oral history sort of to another level and not just having the audio, but also adding images together with that. And I don't have a slide for this, but there's a free platform that Adobe has called Adobe Spark and they have Adobe Spark Video. You can use their website. They also have free apps for the iPhone and iPad, as well as for Android. Anyway, that's just a, that's a great tool to be able to use. So uh, my question's for you. How are you going to start chasing stories and oral history in your life? Will you do some family oral history? Are you gonna do some classroom learning? 
Uh, maybe you're thinking about community-based history. That Murmur project might have gotten you thinking about what you what you might do in your local community to be able to, to get stories, because this could be a collaborative thing, right? Not just relying on you. I love the idea of having you know students interview role models, uh, graduates of your school, creating you know oral histories. Um, we're talking about actually maybe doing something like that at our school during this uh, COVID-19 coronavirus time. You know, having folks tell us a little bit about like what did you do, you know, to get in in it in school to get to where you are today. What do you like about your job, and how do you use you know, science, math, and 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 English language arts, you know, in your life or something? And then doing a little video conference, but all that stuff could be recorded and it could be shared, uh, you know, either with video or with audio. Um, the website I mentioned at the beginning about uh, be a digital witness for your family. That website, dw4jc.com, is a is another link that goes to that project. You know, you may have some some other other ideas. So, I want to challenge you as we are going to wrap up here and do some questions. What app are you going to play with first? Okay, I'm going to encourage you to just go ahead and download one of these apps if if you've got you know a smartphone or a tablet and start to play with it. I want you to think about whose story you need to tell. Maybe it's your own story, right? Think about this. Your great, great, great grandchildren might be able to listen to a story you record tonight or tomorrow or next week when we're stuck in our houses because we're you know, supposed to be socially distancing. And I think it's very good we're gonna do this based on what's happened in Italy. I'm glad that we're getting serious about that here in the United States. But hey, what a great time to be able to, to document stories. And the last thing is, how are you going to empower other people to do that? Um, I would love it if you'll share these slides, you know, share uh, this video. Uh, this is going to continue to be shared on the website, uh, designcreateshare.com. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of folks that we can probably think of that would be energized by this prospect of not only telling stories, but chasing stories and finding stories with others in the family or in the community that, that they can have. So I'll go ahead and answer some questions that have been put into the chat and oh gosh I'm two minutes over so I'll I'll keep us just well there's really nothing that's going to force us to leave but if, if you do need to go I certainly understand because we're after the top of the hour but I'm going to go ahead and answer some questions and if you've got any more please put those into the chat. Um, we have a question. Uh, I have some old interviews on old media, recommendations for bringing them into the computer age. Uh, so I think that, um, you know, it just it it just depends. You're gonna have to have a player for that format. As an example, um, we have video eight, I think tapes that were wider and bigger than the micro digital video tapes and, you know, you're going to need to find a player somewhere. NASA has had this problem with some of the Apollo uh, footage that was taken on super old cameras that, that they don't have anymore to play that, that film. So um, I can actually add that under resources um, to, uh, and you can reach out to me if, if I neglect to put this into the slide. You know, there still are a few camera stores. You know, we used to have uh, radio shacks around, right? And my dad paid to get some old VHS tapes, you know, converted into digital and put on to DVD. Uh, it can be expensive to do that. I know that librarians are a good resource, so I'd recommend checking with your local library. You might also check with your, your local, you know, college or university if you've got one, or reach out to what, you know, ones in your state and find out uh, how do they do that and, and for the specific format that you have. Um, we've got another question asking about the website that talked about the questions. So I don't remember exactly what slide that was. So let me just go back here in the slideshow. And it's called the Great Questions List. And goodness, let me exit here and see. I don't remember. Oh, it was under workflow. So currently, and this number might change. Um, it might change uh, if I if I add a couple slides, but right now this is slide 29. And so this is an archive of the old StoryCorps website. So they've updated their website, but they've they've archived it. And this is one of my favorite things. They used to have an interactive tool that you could say, who are you interviewing? You know, is the person alive or are you going to tell a story about someone who's passed away? And then, you know, it would, it would generate those kinds of questions. So if you Google great questions list story core, uh, you can find that. And then we've got the direct link uh, on slide 29. Any other questions that anybody would like to ask 
about anything that we have talked about in terms of family oral history. Well, I want to thank you for joining us tonight. I want to remind you that the session will be available and that website that you see at the bottom of your screen, designcreateshare.com. I will literally this evening, uh, before I go to bed here, just take the, the video that's recorded here in GoToMeeting and I'll be putting it right up onto YouTube. And so you'll be able to find it there and you can share that. I would love for you to share that widely you know, with anybody that you can, you know, share that on social media, email that to people and let me know what you do with this, right? I, I hope I in, in, inspired you in some way and empowered you to be able to go and do some of these interviews on Twitter. Uh, my my handle is W Fryer, but you can also just Google my name, uh, Wesley Fryer, and you'll find my website, westfryer.com. I actually have a contact link there. I try not to put my email address out on the web because I don't want to get spam, uh, but I have a contact form that you can fill out and you can get in contact with me. And so I just, I'd love to know what people are doing because this is something as hopefully you, you got a flavor for tonight. I'm, I've am i been passionate about for a long time and I don't think that's gonna change. And it really is a fantastic way to, uh, you know, learn and uh, gain, gain skills because there's a rich set of skills that students and that, that we ourselves as adults can be uh, honing and developing. Uh, but it, it's also something that contributes, right? This this pays it forward. And so I, I guess we let's just conclude with that last uh, slide I didn't put at the end. But, you know, who is going to tell your story? You know, it's you. You're the one. So hope this has been helpful. Thank you guys for tuning in. And also, uh, I guess the last thing I didn't put this in the slideshow, this is the first of a series that I'm starting. And so I'm just going to do these on Thursday night at the same time. So if this doesn't work for you, they'll also be recorded and you can check them out later, but you can register free on Eventbrite by going to designcreateandshare.com. Next week, we're going to be talking about keeping your family and yourself safe online as far as uh, safety with, with passwords and password managers and, and other things that we can do to prevent uh, identity theft and uh, kinds of crimes that can harm us. And then we'll be talking about becoming a more connected educator the week after that. So hope you can join us for another webinar and I hope you have a great rest of your evening. Take care, everybody.